Good morning. Uh, happy Hallows Eve Eve. Uh, today we're taking a slightly different approach to the Backyard Naturalist series as we look at a backyard plant that has become a symbol for the holiday, the pumpkin, in as gourd as it gets. And I have to thank Danny Pirtle for the creative genius behind this week's title. I was stuck on anything pumpkin and squash and I couldn't find anything. So thank you, Danny. This is, uh, this is a series that looks at common backyard plants and animals and reveals the extraordinary stories they have to tell. This episode is brought to you by the UEC In My Backyard. And if you haven't visited this site recently, it's becoming hard to keep up with all the fantastic content. Uh, so I encourage you to visit the website early and often. There are two new contributions in Espanol from Miguel, one with his children on La Pada Salvaje or the riverbank grape uh, or the wild grape and an activity showing the life cycle of the monarch butterfly. There's a leaf report activity for kids. There's a story with Tori on the book Leaf Man. Uh, Skipper the squirrel talks about Wisconsin's five squirrel species. There's ideas for six spooky snacks for your Halloween party. There's a how to roast pumpkin seeds. And your homework for next week is to watch Danny's five facts about the spider pumpkin. But for today's pumpkin themed episode, the movie trailer will consist of Olivia and Madeline's How to Make an Oozing Pumpkin. So enjoy. Hi, I'm Madeline. And I'm Olivia. And today we'll be doing the Oozing, oozing pumpkin. pumpkin. Before every science experiment, a good scientist makes a hypothesis. This is a prediction about what they think is going to happen in their experiment. Take a minute to pause the video and make a hypothesis. What do you think is going to happen when we add hydrogen peroxide, soap, water, yeast, and food coloring all together. This experiment does get a little bit messy, so if you're trying this at home, you're going to want to spread something out on your table like a garbage bag. For this experiment, you are going to need a cup of hydrogen peroxide, two tablespoons of dish soap, and then you're going to add a couple drops of food coloring of your choosing. We're picking green. And of course, a carved pumpkin. You're then going to take your mixture and carefully place it inside your pumpkin. So then want to add about a half a cup of warm water. Then you're going to add two packets of active dry yeast to your water. Put your yeast and water together. Now with your yeast mixture ready to go, remove the top of your pumpkin and watch the magic happen. chemical reaction, the yeast acts as a catalyst to break down the hydrogen peroxide into oxygen in its gas state. The dish soap then traps that gas and creates this foamy mixture that you see. Make sure you have adult supervision before trying this at home. Thanks for tuning in to UEC in my backyard. Bye! All right, thank you Madeline and Olivia. Uh, and I do want to give a shout out to, once again to the Ologies podcast with Allie Ward and her episode with author Ann Copeland, who wrote the book, Pumpkin, Pumpkin, Folklore History, Planting Hints and Good Eating, av available at Boswell Books in the third edition. A bunch of today's material comes from this wonder wonderful episode. And I found another delightful podcast with a pumpkin episode called Schmanners with the subtext, Extraordinary Etiquette for Ordinary Occasions, which is new to me, and I'm glad I came across it. Okay, so let's look at that special container that was used for Olivia and Madeline's experiment. It's the pumpkin. We know that the pumpkin comes from a plant. And for more on what makes a plant a plant, you can look back at the mycorrhizae or oak tree episodes from season one. What we call the pumpkin comes from the pumpkin plant. And lest there be any confusion, the pumpkin is the fruit of the pumpkin plant. So don't let anybody think you're eating a vegetable when you're eating a piece of pumpkin pie because you are eating a fruit and not just any fruit. The pumpkin is a berry. It's technically a berry because it's a fleshy fruit with three layers and multiple seeds that comes from a single flower containing one single ovary. That's the definition of a berry. We'll break it down a bit more, but the next time someone asks you, hey, wanna go berry picking? You tell them you're gonna need a bigger bucket because I wanna pick pumpkin berries. And while we're at it, want to know what else is technically a berry? All this stuff, eggplants, bananas, oranges, and cucumbers are all berries. And want to take a guess at what things aren't berries? 
all this stuff. Strawberries, raspberries, blackberries, and cherries. None of these are considered true berries. Of course, it gets a bit complicated with uh, what people have been calling berries, you know, over time in different cultures. But botanically speaking, a berry, according to the Life Science website, has a few characteristics in common. First, there are three distinct fleshy layers, as we see in this pumpkin berry. All berries have an outer skin called an exocarp. Carp comes from the term carpal as part of the flower. A middle area, which is usually fleshy, and that's called a mesocarp, a middle carp. And an inner endocarp, which surrounds or is attached to the seeds. In the case of the pumpkin, the exocarp is that tough outer skin. The mesocarp is the firm part that we turn into pumpkin pie. And the endocarp is that slimy, fibrous, oozy material uh, in which the seeds are embedded that we usually scrape out before we make our jack-o'-lanterns. And you can eat that squishy part of the pumpkin, if you're wondering. Uh, few people do, but you can, you can use it in soups, you can use it in ciders, and you can even eat it raw. Uh, in fact, every single part of the pumpkin plant, including the stem, is edible. The leaves are an edible green. You can eat them raw, but most people saute them. The flowers are edible, and in some places, fried squash blossoms are a delicacy. Some people even bake that hard outer skin of the pumpkin and turn them into pumpkin chips. And if, you, if you're looking for some, a fun way to spend some time, just look at websites that there's, there's several of them that show you how to eat every single part of the pumpkin. So definitely check that out if you have some time, maybe give it a try one year if you haven't already. And while we're at it, let's take a quick look at the cross sections of some more berries like the green pepper. So yes, the green pepper and all the chili peppers are fruits and also berries. And you can start to see some similarities when you look at the half pumpkin next to the half pepper. There's a hard outer skin on the pepper that we eat. There's the pulp of the pepper. And then there's those soft white strands attached to the seeds. And there are your three layers. And you could, you could carve a pepper into a face if you wanted also. So if we start to think about the parts of other true berries uh, that we like to eat, and it certainly varies depending on the fruit. So, so these are all berries with three distinct layers. In the pumpkin, it's that middle fleshy part that we usually eat, the mesocarp, and we usually dispose of the other parts. In the watermelon, it's that inner part or the endocarp that we eat usually and dispose of the outer skin and the middle rind, uh, unless you know some kids like to eat all of that rind as well, and adults. Uh, in the grape, we eat all three layers, just pop the whole thing in our mouth. Uh, but if it's an old school variety of grape, we'll spit out or crunch those seeds, uh, just like we spit out the seeds of the watermelon. But please don't dispose of the seeds in the pumpkin because pumpkin seeds are super tasty and they're super nutritious. And there's archaeological evidence of pre-Incan humans in Central America, 7,500, 8,500 years ago, uh, people were cultivating pumpkins and eating the seeds. So if you really want to connect with early humanity, engage in a little pumpkin roasting on a fire. In my family, we always try to roast uh, the seeds from any kind of squash that we eat, not just the pumpkins. You can, you can pretty much roast any kind of squash seeds, butternut, acorn, spaghetti. And it's important that I say seeds, plural, because the other characteristic of a berry is that it has multiple seeds that come from a single flower that has a single ovary. So technically, cherries would be considered berries, except that they only have one central pit and are instead classified as droops. They're fruit, they're not berries, and they are droops, a type of fruit. So don't let anyone ever get away with saying you're going berry picking when you're harvesting cherries. You correct them and you say, we're not berry picking, we're droop picking because cherries are droops because they only have one seed. And for reasons I'm not going to get into, mainly because I really don't quite understand it, it's super complicated. Avocados are an exception to the rule in that even though they have a single pit, they're still considered a berry with three layers, the outer skin, the middle fleshy part, and there's that thin inner layer surrounding the seed that we don't eat. So why aren't raspberries and strawberries considered berries? Uh, it's because of that characteristic that besides being a fleshy fruit, fruit with three layers, it's coming from a single flower with a single ovary. So raspberries and strawberries 
do come from single flowers, but those flowers contain multiple ovaries, and so they're considered aggregate fruits. In the case of the raspberry, each ovary in the flower forms a single spherical droop. Uh, so each of those little spheres in the raspberry comes from a separate ovary with its own seed. Strawberries are a slightly different classification um, and the seeds end up on the outside of the fruit. But again, each of those seeds comes from a different ovary in the flower. And that's one of the reasons why raspberries and strawberries have that crunchy quality sometimes um, and, and why they can be hard on your digestive system. So some folks with, with sensitive digestive systems will avoid the aggregate fruits like raspberries and strawberries uh, because of all those tiny seeds and the irritation that they cause. So if you're ever cooking with someone and you're looking for conversation starter, cut open a butternut squash or a tomato or a cucumber or an eggplant and you know, tell your friend that these are berries that you're preparing. If they don't believe you, you can point out the three layers and the multiple seeds. And so even in, in the four pictures you see here, it's pretty easy to find the outer skin the middle pulp, and that inner seed matrix that makes them berries. And then the next time you're eating one of those fleshy fruits that we consider more traditional fruits, you can kind of take a closer look at the an anatomy and try to guess, am I eating a berry with multiple seeds? Am I eating a droop with a single pit? Am I eating an aggregate of multiple droops? Um, and of course, because nothing can be simple, uh, there are other categories of fruits like apples and pears are technically poems. Um, and it, it, it gets really complicated. Oranges are a specific type of berry that has sections. Uh, so yeah, it's, it's a fun rabbit hole to go down. Uh, but if you only remember one thing from this talk, it should be that pumpkins are a true as a berry as they come. So now that we know that pumpkins are berries and essentially the entire pumpkin plant is edible, what else can we learn about the pumpkin as a plant? First of all, we can separate pumpkins from other plants that we've talked about in the series in that they are in the order cucurbitalis. The root of cucurbitalis is cucurbita, which is Latin for gourd. Uh, it's a Latin word I'm giving a Spanish accent to. And it's also the root of the familiar cucumber, which uh, is, as we know, a berry uh, distantly related to the pumpkin berry. There are about 2,600 species in this family and the most familiar groups are the begonias, a uh, familiar flower, and the gourds. If we move down a level, pumpkins belong to the family cucurbitaceae, a name that I love, especially how it rolls off your tongue, cucurbitaceae, also called cucurbits, or more familiar, this is the gourd family which has about a thousand species, uh, many of which are and have historically been extremely important to humans as a food source and arguably one of the most important and influential families of plants to humanity. This group also includes watermelons, cucumbers, bitter melons, and other melons, and a plant called the lufa, a name that might sound familiar. It's a fruit popular in China, India, and Vietnam. And if you're gonna eat it, you have to harvest the fruit early because the ripe fruit becomes especially hard and fibrous and inedible. So instead the ripe fruits are used in bathrooms and kitchens as the loofah sponge. So there's another thing to think about. If you wanna be really accurate, you could call it a loofah berry, uh, but it's a loofah sponge. This family also includes the bottle gourds native to Africa, like the calabash, which like the loofah, they can be eaten when young, but Usually they're allowed to mature when they become inedible and they're used as vessels for food or liquids or as decorative items or as musical instruments. So considering these are berries, the most important part of the berry in this case, or in these cases, is that hard outer layer that forms uh, these instruments. So now we'll move one step closer to the pumpkin species and we move to the genus Cucurbita. Uh, so this is a group of mostly vines, mostly ground vines native to Central and South America. And they include the domesticated species that we know of as squash or that we refer to as squash. The varieties known as summer squash 
are eaten in the early stages of development, like the lufa, when the outer skins are still soft enough that we can eat them. So a zucchini is a summer squash, and we eat the skin. Then there are the varieties we know of as winter squash, which are eaten after they've matured enough so that the outer skin has hardened. And that allows these fruits to be stored for a long time into and eaten in the winter, which is why they're known as, known as winter squash. That's when we eat them. Um, and, and which means, however, that the skin usually becomes too tough to eat uh, in most cases. But as I mentioned, we found ways to eat even the tough pumpkin skins. There are several species of cucurbita that have been domesticated and cultivated and crossbred to form what we colloquially, colloquially call pumpkins. But the traditional Halloween front porch pumpkin comes from the species cucurbita pepo. Pepo comes from ancient Greek, meaning cooked by the sun. So cucurbita pepo translates to gourd cooked in the sun. We don't really know what the original wild species looked like, but it was likely smaller and more bitter tasting than our pumpkins. And uh, as I mentioned earlier, they were grown by, by civilizations that predate the Inca in, in Mesoamerica. So humans in the Americas have been cultivating pumpkins for almost 10,000 years. And from this original ancestral pumpkin, we turned out several cultivars by crossbreeding for desirable characteristics. And this means literally going in and playing the part of the pollinator, usually, uh, which happens naturally by bees. There are squash bees. Um, but when humans do it, we're, we're looking for characteristics that, we're like, that we like, and we're enhancing those characteristics. And so in modern day terms, that literally means going and taking a Q-tip and collecting the pollen, pretending you're a little bee buzzing around, collecting pollen from one male plant, and then using that Q-tip to deposit the pollen in the female flowers of other plants that you're trying to crossbreed. If you do this for long enough, and people in the Americas have been, you start developing breeds just like we humans did with dogs. And from the same species of ancestral pumpkin, in this case, Cucurbita pepo, we bred varieties of squash, like the patty pan squash on the upper left, the yellow summer squash on the upper right, the zucchini on the lower right, and the pumpkin on the lower left. So all four of these pictured squashes are the same species. Uh, pumpkins and zucchinis are the same species, just as a chihuahua and a German shepherd are the same species. So if you go to the grocery store and pick up an acorn squash, a delicata squash, a spaghetti squash, a zucchini, and, and, and you throw in a decorative gourd, your shopping cart is full of the same species of plant, one species of plants, just different varieties. The word pumpkin and squash are most likely derived from the Wampanoag people who spoke a dialect of the Massachusetts language in New England and who introduced pumpkins to the English settlers. Their word for the fruit was popukan, meaning grows forth round. The, the term pumpkin has no botanical significance and is used interchangeably with squash and winter squash. But again, for many of us, pumpkin signifies that bright orange doorstep pumpkin, uh, also known as the Connecticut field pumpkin. But there are a lot of other pumpkins out there. There's the, whoops, there's the kabocha squash, also known as kabasi or the Japanese pumpkin, which is commonly cooked in tempura and maybe one of the tastiest of all the tempura vegetables, the first to go. Uh, you have Casper pumpkins and peanut pumpkins, Long Island cheese pumpkins and white ghost pumpkins. There's warty goblin and baby boo, porcelain doll and rascal. Uh, it would be really fun to be the person that names all these pumpkins. And again, pumpkins have been cultivated for thousands of years with many, many medicinal benefits. They've been used to treat skin injuries and intestinal, in intestinal infections. Uh, the L-tryptophan has known benefits in treating depression. Pumpkins decrease the risk of uh, kidney stones. And just a few weeks ago, we were talking about uh, parasites that humans can get from slugs and snails. And pumpkins have antiparasitic properties that have shown effective and been used in treating some of the diseases that we get from snails. Pumpkins have also worked their way into the stories that humans have told from around the world, including the old world cultures in Europe, Asia, and Africa, uh, even though they didn't arrive in those parts until the 1500s. 
Uh, there are several cultures in which the creation of humanity comes from a pumpkin. One in particular uh, involves a woman who gives birth to a pumpkin, and then that pumpkin is chopped into a lot of tiny pieces and each one becomes a human. Um, there are several stories where people survive floods by floating in pumpkins. There are stories, stories of people riding pumpkin vines into new lands, like Mary Beth's vine in her backyard because they are so fast growing. In Europe and Asia in particular, pumpkins successfully squashed their way into some old myths, legends, and customs. For example, the story of Cinderella is actually more than 2,000 years old. And in early tellings of the story, the mom is reincarnated as a fish. And it's not until the 1600s in France, after pumpkins are introduced to Europe, that the pumpkin carriage works its way into the Cinderella story long before Walt Disney. And of course, there's also Peter Peter Pumpkin Eater, which like all of the nursery rhymes tells an innocent story of a man who had an unfaithful wife. So he essentially had her fitted with a chastity belt. The jack-o'-lantern today is synonymous with pumpkins in most of the world, but the original story is several thousand years old like Cinderella and it originates in the British Isles before pumpkins were introduced. There are several versions of the story, but the basic telling goes something a little bit like this. So there was an old trickster and his name was Stingy Jack. Stingy Jack worked out a deal with the devil to trick bartenders into giving them free beer. The devil would turn himself into a coin. Jack would then use that coin to pay for a beer. And then later the devil would turn back into himself and Jack and the devil would enjoy their beer together free of charge. But one day, Jack decides to trap the devil in his pocket by putting a wooden cross in that pocket. And because the devil can't change back into a human when he's next to a wooden cross, uh, the devil becomes trapped in Jack's pocket in coin form. And finally, Jack comes around and agrees to release the devil from his pocket if the devil promises to stay away for a year can probably see where this is going and if jack dies during that year the devil will promise not to banish jack to hell so the devil is trying to get out of this pocket and he he any way he can and so he agrees he's, he's not too happy and then when the year is up he comes back for his revenge on jack but jack being the swindler that he is asks for one final wish that the devil would go up into a tree and pick some fruit for him, possibly some berries, more likely a droop or a poem. And the devil foolishly agrees. And this time, Jack tricks the devil by trapping him in the tree where he's getting the fruit as he carves a cross into the base of the tree. And because of that cross, the devil can't escape the tree. So now the devil is really pissed. He was fooled twice by the same person. And... Like last time, Jack comes around and agrees to release the devil if he stays away for 10 years under the same terms as before. And the devil reluctantly agrees. But lo and behold, Jack does die before the 10 years are up. And since the devil agreed uh, not to bring him to hell. Um, let's see. Oh, here's the tree. So, so since Jack agreed not to bring him to hell, uh, Jack goes up to heaven. And St. Peter's like, uh, nope, sorry, you're not coming here. You're a swindler. You're a miser and a trickster. Uh, you're, you're not coming into heaven. And this puts the advantage back in the devil's hands where the devil now sentences Jack to an eternity of walking the earth, carrying a hot coal. And apparently carrying a hot coal is just as painful to a damned spirit as it is to a human. So Jack hollowed out a turnip to keep the hot coal in to save him from the pain. And because the turnip had a glowing ember in it, it acted as a lantern. Hence you have Jack of the Lantern. So more or less that's the story. And because Hollow's Eve is that time where the lines between the living and non-living world are at their thinnest, uh, people, especially children, carved faces in turnips and put the turnips in windowsills or on doorsteps to scare away Jack of the Lantern from visiting their houses. Sometimes, particularly in Ireland, the story is told with potatoes, so the faces are carved in potatoes. 
Um, I don't know about you, but that carved turnip face is scarier than any carved pumpkin I've ever seen in my lifetime. And so you are looking at the original jack-o'-lanterns, uh, but like with Cinderella, at some point, the pumpkin worked its way into the story, especially in the Americas, in the Americas, where European settlers were kind of crazy about pumpkins. So crazy that in addition to using them for food and medicine and decoration, they found another use up in New England, specifically in New Haven. So now I'm reading from A.K. Roche. In 18th century New Haven, the law set the limit for a man's hair length. And every Saturday, all the men lined up for a weekly haircut. One week, the cutting cap disappeared and the men were at a loss. Uh, after trying an assortment of ill-fitting substitutes, they hit upon the idea of a pumpkin, not too large, not too small, not too ripe. Thereafter, the men lined up each Saturday under a, under a hollowed out half pumpkin. And that is the story of how the people of New Haven came to be known as the pumpkins head, pumpkin heads. So a hollowed out half pumpkin made that perfect template guide for haircuts, the original bowl haircut, at least in the Americas. And it's not only folks from New Haven, but uh, from other parts of New England who are still sometimes referred to as pumpkin heads. But uh, don't worry, Jenny, I did my research and this does not apply to Wisconsin transplants. So you are officially still a cheese head. And uh, for one town in particular, pumpkins were so important that the town was called Pumpkinshire and that place is still around today, but it blossomed into a much larger city that we now call Boston in Massachusetts. Uh, I really wish they would have kept the original name so, so we could watch the Pumpkinshire Red Sox on TV or the Pumpkinshire Celtics or, or the New England Pumpkinheads, but it is what it is. And as we wrap things up, I'm gonna skip those abominations known as pumpkin spice and pumpkin beer, but apart from those, Many people consider that pumpkins are one of the most underrated fruits, and there's a whole lot of pumpkin uses still waiting to be discovered by many, like pumpkin jewelry, necklaces and brooches. Some pumpkin bitter oils are used as a culinary oil and are a potential source for biofuels. We all know about pumpkin pie, canned pumpkin, and pumpkin seeds, but there's also pumpkin leaf kimchi, roasted pumpkin, pumpkin chili, stuffed pumpkins, and even pumpkin fries. Early colonial settlers would carve a hole in the pumpkin, not, not to, to, to make a face out of it, but they would add either savory spices to the inside of the pumpkin or sweet ingredients uh, like cream and nutmeg. And then after they closed up the hole again, that pumpkin became the perfect cooking vessel. And then they could bury the pumpkin in the original slow cooker down in the hot coals of a fire and let it let it go for the day. When the time was up, they would take the pumpkin out and it was either a delicious roasted pumpkin, a savory version, or it was that cooked pie in the shell, the original pumpkin pie. But uh, no matter how you prepare them, pumpkins are one of the most nutritious foods along with the squashes, the other squashes, and uh, one of the three sisters uh, of lore, the squash, along with beans and corn. So, as we wind down this pumpkin episode, we still have two really important topics to cover. First, pumpkin growing contests. And I heard we're gonna, we're gonna get a link to, to the ins and outs of pumpkin growing. Um, from what I know, how they grow these massive pumpkins starts with the right kind of seed, just like all these cultivars of pumpkins, you need, uh, they start with the same kind of giant pumpkin growing seeds and um, so the biggest pumpkins usually come from a particular breed of pumpkin. But once you get the seed, apparently it takes a whole lot of uh, TLC. You grow the pumpkin either on a soft bed of hay or a cloth, and you need to constantly move the pumpkin to kind of strengthen all of the sides so it doesn't squash under its own weight. And uh, the, the top pumpkin growers apparently or at least some of them swear by fertilizing pumpkins with milk. Um, so with all that, what's the record for the largest pumpkin in the world? Uh, it keeps changing, but the latest that I found was that there's a Belgian 
horticulturalist who grew a pumpkin that weighed in at 2,624 pounds, which is the same weight as a full-grown water buffalo. So finally, we'll uh, end the session with a short video. If you haven't heard of Pumpkin Chunkin', you're in for a treat. And uh, let's watch that now. Get a horn? Steve Seegers is on the cusp of a new world record. Can Yankee Siege complete rival Matt DeFrancesco's challenge and hurl a thousand pound pumpkin? Okay. Will Steve's machine be up to the task? Three, two, one. <laughs> A world record, the largest pumpkin ever chunked by a trebuchet. And it worked! <laughs> pumpkin Chunk, Super Chunk, Saturday, November 29th at 8 on Science. I'm so sorry I missed that episode. Uh, and apparently for Pumpkin Chunk, and there are rules, you can't use explosives. Uh, but there are categories of Pumpkin Chunk, and you can use compressed air. You can use trebuchets. Uh, I think there might be a couple other categories and it's a thing. So if you wanna explore that thing, uh, that's what Google's for. You can look at pumpkin chunkin videos. And uh, it also kind of exposes a, a culture of, of the, I think particularly the US and uh, it's an interesting one. So with that, that concludes as gorgeous as it gets. And thank you for watching.